Hello there, it's Susie Walker here from Psychologies Magazine, and I am here with the wonderful Caroline Goyder. And Caroline is a voice coach, and she is a author of um, Find Your Voice, which I don't know whether you saw um, a broadcast we did with Caroline last month, but I was raving about this brand new book that's just come out, which is really great. It's all about you know how to um, be able to speak so people will actually listen. So, um, but you also, your other books as well, you've got Gravitas and your TED Talk is massive. So I also would recommend Caroline's TED Talk. And let me, the, the surprising secret, I can't, I've got my gust on. Um, the surprising secret that speaking with confidence, what is it? But 7.5 yep. hits, but it's brilliant. What's the title of the TED Talk? The surprising secret to speaking with confidence. It is indeed, that's right. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So I'm so delighted to be talking to you today. And what we wanted to focus on a little bit today was this idea of being on a Zoom call. So let's start there because all of us, I don't know, I'm on the Zoom. I was already on Zoom a lot, but with lockdown, constantly on Zoom. Let's start there, Karen. What's the best thing we can do to own the Zoom call? Or not, I mean, my friends are horrendous on it. You know, it's a... <laughs> stuff and they're carrying the thing around and they're eating and talking at once it drives me insane and it's bad enough having to do it for you know professional but it's even worse when you're doing it with your friends what advice have you got to give us around how to create a brilliant zoom experience so I'm, i hope you don't mind i'm going to get a prop okay great great it's another, I'm going to unbrand this prop. It's actually gin. So the answer to Zoom is not is not gin. But let me explain. It's about a bottleneck. Yeah. I'm going to step away from the gin now. I got because really excited there for a moment. I thought you were going to say, finally, an expert who understands me. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you're on a cocktail Zoom session, then gin is the answer. But the the thing that is a problem for people with Zoom is is bottlenecks, lots of bottlenecks. And the first bottleneck is how we sit or stand. Because we're both on laptops. I imagine you're on a laptop, not a desktop. I yeah, I I'm on a laptop. Um, and we're used to sitting at laptops kind of hunched over, yes. writing emails, yeah. writing pieces. Yes. And we get confused because we're still on our laptop. But of course, what makes a good Zoom call is voice and connection and energy. Yes. And I was listening to Front Row last night on Radio 4 and there was a lovely actor talking and the, the um, interviewer said, what do you do to warm up? And he said, I just put voice and movement together because I know that that's the best way to get the instrument working. When we're on Zoom, we're really on broadcast. And I, I know that's gruesome to say, but it's true. And I, I don't mean you have to perform because everybody, nobody wants that. But I do think we have to look after the instrument because our voice, our body, our expression is what people are reading. And so my first tip around this bottleneck would be either, your posture is beautiful, Susie, by the way, oh, either great. sit up yeah. or stand up. Now, I don't know if people, I can show people, but I've got a laptop stand. I don't know if that, that really um, illuminates okay. anything. Because okay. I've found if I sit for Zoom calls, my energy is a lot lower, my voice is a lot less powered up, I feel okay. less confident. So I just bought a laptop stand and it, okay, it's so changed want, my life. Yeah, okay, so it's yeah. like you just get it and you just put your laptop on it. So you're so you're literally standing. So you're standing I'm, now. I'm standing, I've got Uggs on, so I'm not gonna show you my feet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> not pajamas. Already, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but if you if you don't wanna stand up, that's fine. The next best thing you can do for your voice is just to sit really well. And the reason for this, and I think psychology's listeners will know about this, is the psoas muscle. Because the psoas muscle is the fight or flight muscle. It's what we, it's what fires into action when we have to run away or punch someone. And if we sit and hunch all day at a laptop and then have a Zoom yeah. call, that psoas, the hip, is really gripping. How and that makes us how do you spell it, psoas muscle. P S O A S. The right. psoas muscle. No, I have heard of that. Yes. Okay. It goes through the hip and reaches all the way up into the mid back around the diaphragm. Yeah. And so if we sit like this, 
Yeah. Well, it gets really tense. Conscious, make really conscious. Yeah. Your body is beautiful, but okay. our voices get tense. And then we go, why am I so tense? Why is my voice so thin? And it's just because we've been sitting all day. So the yeah. best thing you can do for your Zoom calls is to stretch and move. And if you feel like it, sing, hum, maybe not on the call, but maybe five minutes before the call. And you'll show up with a kind of uncorked energy, which is charismatic and people will respond to. There's a second bottleneck, which was hence the gin bottle. And the second bottleneck is the audio on Zoom calls. There's only, you know, when we're in a, a cocktail party or in a meeting room, you can layer voices over each other. I can speak, you can speak, we can pick up, we can echo. It's a lovely feeling. On Zoom, there's only one audio channel. So one person speaks, the other person cuts off. And that can feel really weird. And the, you just have to work with that. You just have to use the difficulty. And it's where chat comes in. It's where asking each person to speak one at a time comes in, because then we don't cut over each other. So two bottlenecks, one is posture, one is the audio channel. Use them consciously. Yeah, okay. So when you have that thing around the confidence, I think there's a lot of thing around confidence about speaking up. It, it, it almost makes it even more intense, you know, that you, you've got all of these things. You, can I speak now? How do we build that confidence? It's interesting confidence, isn't it? I think what I would say about that is you can't shortcut preparation. So I, I mean, I learned this as an actor and training actors that, you see, I don't think confidence is um, something that is at identity level. I think it's habitual. And I'm a massive introvert. I'm never happier than sitting quietly with a book. But what acting taught me is that if I have to extrovert, like now, I just need 15, 20 minutes to, you know, to warm up, to stretch, to breathe, to sing, to hum, just to get ready for the moment where the lights go on. And Kate Blanchett talks about this and she calls it literally turning the lights on. And you have mo a moment before the call to go inside, lights off. And then when you go on the call, you turn the lights on. And for introverts, it's important to know that you probably can't turn the lights on all day. If you have 15 Zoom calls, it's going to be really difficult to feel confident for that whole time. So give yourself turning lights on time in your day before important calls and then maximize the lights on uh, yeah. and, and don't overdo it. If it's a phone call, make it a phone call. You don't always have to put the camera on, but confidence is a habit, not an identity thing. I, and I love that idea. And I love the idea of it. You just switch it on. You switch, you switch the lights on. I understand that. Stress affects the voice. Oh yeah. How can we, because when you're stressed, you've got that, how can, how can we deal with, how can we stop feeling stressed or how can we have it not affect our voices? It's horrible, isn't it? It's hard. I, I had a call last night and I was tired and I'd been sitting all day and I was aware that my voice was thin and it was kind of caught up in my upper chest. And I, I talk to clients and they say, I stand in front of an audience and I, my voice shakes and my hands shake. And it's no wonder that people say, I hate public speaking because you're in front of an audience and you're visibly frightened. I mean, that's just, just such a horrible combination. Yeah. But we have more control than we realize. There's a lovely book by Antonio Damasio, who's a neuroscientist, and it's called The Feeling of What Happens. And I, I understood about 70% of it. There were 30% that was straight over my head. But the 70% that I did understand, there was a moment in it where he talks about our control of the voice. And he says, basically, the larynx, we didn't evolve early on to speak. You know, when we first existed as human beings, this was just a, a sphincter. It was a protective valve for the respiratory system. But as evolution progressed, we, we spoke. And so we started to develop a degree of conscious control over the larynx. And he says, although most of the unconscious nervous system well, it is precisely that, it's unconscious, because speech is conscious, this valve can give us some a kind of back way into the unconscious. What nervous speakers universally do is when they pause to breathe, 
there's a kind of gasp, you know, and it's the gasp of fear, it's the gasp of stress. But what actors, what professionals are taught to do is when you pause, you don't gasp because that says to your system, fight or flight, run away. Instead, you know that all speech is out breath, a pause is an in breath. So you close your mouth. Yeah. You imagine your favorite smell. Yeah. And then you speak. And it's like stroking your unconscious nervous system. It's saying you're safe. And as an introvert, for whom standing in front of lots of people should be my worst nightmare. You know, I've spoken to big audiences now and, and what makes it nice is that when I get on stage, I ground my feet, I look out at the audience, I imagine old friends, I close my mouth, I breathe in a lovely smell, I feel safe and then I start. And I can be quiet and me in front of lots of people and I just wish that everybody knew that because it doesn't have to be public speaking, you know, big deal. It can just be you on stage talking about what matters to you because it's going to help people. And that's a really nice place to be. But what about the adrenaline? I mean, what I find is that when the adrenaline kicks in, I, so I, I'm, a, I'm getting better. And my awareness of it is better. But when the adrenaline, I, I can be very, I mean, I'm hyper anyway. I'm, I'm too much in that range. How do I, how do I stop the kind of adrenaline kicking up and becoming kind of almost like this squeaky moron? <laughs> it's horrible, isn't it? And it's, it's, it's like um, it's real sports psychology. This, in a way, it's the psychology of performance. Adrenaline is brilliant at a certain point, and then there's a point where it damages, affects performance. And so actors have what's called a half. And I imagine it's a bit like what's hap what happens in the green room off centre court at Wimbledon. Actors get to the theatre early and they spend half an hour physically warming up. I still do this if I have to speak publicly. I still do some yoga okay. and I still do some voice. I, I hum. It's shoulders back. But, We're trying to open this bit, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. It's It's opening up the respiratory system so that you can breathe low and wide. It's relaxing the shoulders, it's relaxing the jaw, the sternocleidomastoid, all of this. It's relaxing the hips because of that psoas reason. It's getting your feet grounded. So move in a way that grounds you. Warm up your voice because that tells your system you're safe. And then have a quiet moment before you walk on stage. And then, this is what actors spend three years at drama school learning, but you can do it way faster than that. When you walk on stage, when the adrenaline hits, it's a great buzz. It's a feeling of fun. It's like what Fritz Perls said, um, fear is excitement without the breath. That's, that's it. That's what an acting training is about. It's learning to feel the buzz and see it is excitement, not fear. And we can all learn to do that, really. Yeah, okay. So I think that, that physical, you do the physical, exercising first and then with the, I love that idea of breathing so you know um what is there something we could think are there mantras we should do or in terms of the psychology of it the best um way of framing this I heard was from the actor Bill Nye and it's it's just lovely his frame he said when he was um, younger, he used to hate auditions because he would be very self-conscious, very paranoid. But there was a point where he kind of hit the big time and he was casting his own movies, which is what happens, isn't it? And he said, I would see actors coming in for the audition and they wouldn't be paranoid or neurotic, the good ones. They would come in thinking, how can I help? How can I help this production team choose the right person to make this film a success? And for me, that belief, how can I help, is the thing that flips me from fight or flight, everybody's looking at me, I'm really nervous, imposter syndrome, oh, that feeling, which we all get, right? That's so human. Yeah. If I flip into how can I help, what do I know that will help this audience, however small, you know, however unexciting, how can I help? Then suddenly that fight or flight, imposter syndrome thing, just, it kind of goes quiet because it's, it's, it's arrogance, really. Why does it matter how frightened I am? The audience have come to hear me speak. So get on with it. And how can I help is the best way for me into that. Yeah. 
and I love that idea. I think that's very psychology's idea. It's all, you know, how can we serve rather than what can we take? What can we give? Um, and I think having that mindset is a lovely mindset because it's uh, people feel that feel that in your energy if you're coming in. Oh, yeah. Than to take what can I take this greed selfish da, da, da. I, you know and having compassion for that part of us that perhaps always wants to take but also if you can focus on the giving I think it's wonderful really really great Caroline once again you're super we talked about you doing a regular slot for us um, on Instagram live um, or maybe Facebook live I'm not quite sure how the tech works but we'll figure it out I'd love to. I'd love you to be our psychology's um, voice coach because you're just fantastic and oh. these small things are these small this is small things can really make a difference and you know we're I'm a massive extrovert but all of my team and nearly all of the columnists are introverts and they um the these skills for them because they're, they're far more brilliant than I am <laughs> far more brilliant and I think sometimes I get a lot of space in the room because I'm more loud but it's like shut up <laughs> and let let the the my lovely introverted team talk and if they could learn some of these skills um and not feel so terrified about speaking up or able to manage their energy i think that would really really help so going forward it would be great to have you on our you know on our masthead as our, our psychology voice coach it would be fun. oh i'd love to i love psychologies it's uh, yeah it's exactly in the i love the uh, this contribution thing it's so important yeah so lots of love my dear i will speak to you soon <laughs> Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.